Hi, everybody. Welcome to On the Pony Bus. My name is Tim Easy, and I'm joined today by Easy Blues, and we're here to cover all sorts of bases today. But first, welcome back. back. Your dreams were your, your ticket, ticket out. out. Welcome, welcome back. back. To the same and old place, place that you laughed about. Laughed about. Where the dreams have all changed, changed and turned around. Been around. The now the names the have names remained and they've turned, turned around. Turn the around. dreams, who thought they'd need you? Who, who thought they'd need, need, they need you? Here where we lead you. Oh, they got him on the got spot. On the spot. Welcome, welcome, back. Back. welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Remember the words, Tim. Remember the words. Tim. Remember the words. Okay, welcome here we are, everybody. Back. We are on board the bunny bus, um, the most famous tour band bus in all of New York tour band history. And um, Easy Blues and myself are here to uh, to reminisce and enlighten and entertain. And uh, part of today's enlightenment will be uh, Easy Blues and myself enlightening each other because we both have some very special questions prepared for each other that we're going to be answering a bit later in the episode. Mm -hmm. That will take place during our now already infamous interrogation segment. Uh, which uh, I refer to as already infamous uh, Easy Blues. That is because we've been receiving so much listener mail, and that can only mean that uh, the folks out there in YouTube land are really enjoying not just our Tales from Manchaba, but also our interrogation segment. So good for you, good for me, good for us, and good for everybody out there in YouTube land. Now... <laughs> What's been going on with you this springtime? It's Memorial Day. It's a holiday weekend. I take it you've been uh, having a bit of fun lately? Of course, of course. I, you know, um, at the end of the day, I try to, to have as much fun as humanly possible. Plus, we are getting down to the, the grinding of, of the last couple of weeks of school for, for the little easies. Um, and they are, you know, they are knocking it out of the park. Oh, so, that's good. Good. Yeah. They're bringing home uh, report cards that are nice and tasty. Yes, they're bringing home some tasty report cards. They also uh, have the opportunity. They're going to go see uh, Wicked on Broadway uh, with uh, their eighth grade class as part of their eighth grade graduation. That should be nice. Are you on board with that officially as a chaperone, or you're just you're just going along? No, the I'm. Ride, or how does that work? I'm no, I'm letting them go with with the school so they can have their moment. Um, and I don't. Dad doesn't have to be there for all of these moments, especially as they're getting older. Um, if they wanted me there, they would have asked, and it's okay that they didn't because I really want them to be able to live this without having to worry about what Dad's going to think. Um, you know. Well, that's cool. Have they seen stage productions on a on a theatrical stage of, of this magnitude before? Um, not of this magnitude, but we have done a couple of like local theater things, and and um, some of like the high schools around here do theater uh, aspects. Um, plus, you know, um, I've, I've taken them to like some of the puppet shows that uh, dear friends of mine do um, at uh, Sutured and Pinned. They're phenomenal. So, yeah, be nice. Very nice, very nice. Well, it's good. I see the kids are keeping you busy, and mm -hmm. uh, and my imaginary kids are uh, are keeping me plenty busy too. Um, they keep reminding me to get out there and live life a little bit more to the fullest, especially now that COVID is kind of over now, and yeah. um, you know all of the all of the social distancing nonsense that there was here in Las Vegas um, and the mask mandates and just all the bullshit that's done now. And um, so everybody's been getting back out there to, uh, to, you know, really enjoy themselves. And um, I was uh, given the opportunity to get out and perform live music a couple of times over the past couple of days. So that was very nice. And um, today, no live musical performances for the public for me, although I am, uh, booked to perform at a private party at four o'clock p.m. this afternoon mm. in a, in a rather posh community nearby here called Anthem Anthem Hills. Okay, uh, 
<clears throat> which is nice. I mean, I'll I'll probably feel a bit like a fish out of water, but it's it's not going to be a, a a whole day thing. Um, right. I'll, I'll go and do what I do for a little while, and you know, let the let the folks enjoy some music because hey, I might not be a singer anymore, but I can still let songs fill the air mm. with uh, with the string instruments. So <clears throat> I'm enjoying myself with that. Music keeps me busy, keeps me out of trouble um, or in trouble, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but um, it's been a good, productive little springtime for me. Got a lot of good reading done. Got a lot of good notches carved into my belt in terms of places that I've wanted to go and check out different restaurants, different parks. Um, there's just a never ending stream of things to do, um, which is great, you know, mm. as, uh, and as much fun as that is, none of it is nearly as much fun as looking at the listener mail that, uh, that comes in for our On the Bunny Bus podcast. Yes. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at this, uh, this first letter that uh, comes uh, all the way, uh, comes to us all the way from Joey Flugelhorn in Ronkonkoma, New York. Ronkonkoma. And uh, Joey writes, is deep sea diving really as much fun as everyone says it is? Um, that's a great question, Joey. Uh, what do you think, Easy Blues? Well, I think anything can be fun if you're going to put your heart and soul into it, but also um, to be able to walk into an environment and into a world that you cannot access on an everyday basis, that pure adventure, that challenge uh, thing, to see walks of life in their truest habitat 100% just being and existing um, and making sure you're doing it in a respectful way. You don't want to go in there and like smack around the fish or anything like that you know you want to be there and, and be in their stream and, and and all those kind of things i do feel um it is just as cool as possible i don't think i will ever be as cool as like say you know jacques whatever his name was who like did it forever ever um but yeah uh you know i i definitely yeah i definitely dig it and i like to uh i like to watch it you know if you you, you put something like a screensaver of like the deep bottom of the of the ocean it's very relaxing so, oh yeah, I, I I definitely think it's cool. I have to say I agree, and I also will uh, furthermore add that everything is as much fun as everyone says it is. The first sixty-five thousand times, right? But once you arrive at time number sixty-five thousand and one, <clears throat> maybe it's time for greener pastures. So, live a little, treat yourself, yeah. challenge yourself with something different. Read an author who you've never read a book by before. Take a bus to a part of town you've never seen before. Mm. Walk underneath the Luxor Resort in Las Vegas and marvel at how you can walk subterraneanly underneath. Wait a minute, is subterraneanly even a word? Maybe subterraneously is the way to do it. Walk subterraneously beneath the Luxor Resort and suddenly find yourself at the Excalibur Resort. Or mm -hmm. go walking subterraneously underneath the Luxor Resort and suddenly find yourself underneath the Mandalay Bay Resort. Isn't that strange? Yeah. <clears throat> it sure is a strange old life. But anyway, as far as deep, deep sea diving is concerned, <clears throat> uh, I will say that I have never gone deep sea diving before, but uh, that does not mean that I may not go deep sea diving at some point in the future mm -hmm. um, because who knows you know uh, there's a lot that can happen in the future and um, I may not be into diving really so much these days but that might be my new thing next year one never knows so thanks for the letter Joey that is cool um, uh, and uh, both Easy Blues and myself are in agreement that deep sea diving is indeed cool Yes. And um, all right, good. So now that we've settled that, <clears throat> let's take a look at this other letter. We have a couple of letters to take a look at today. This next okay. letter comes from Benjamin Grackle of Providence, Rhode Island. Hi, Benjamin. And Benjamin writes, how can I have my band be more like the Suck It Easy band? Um, interesting. Okay, Easy Blues, what do you think? It is. Because that's the one thing that I will always say 
from jump anytime you have ever met a musician anytime even i have ever now met a musician to me they are just now members of suck it easy because it's not just a band it's not just a philosophy it's an ethos um you know and and if you play music and you play music live you are at some point being a member of suck it easy and this goes all the way back to the first cave person that banged on a rock to the amazingness of, of, of sister of Rosetta Tharp, you know, to, to, to John Lennon, to Chuck Berry, to Freddie Mercury, everyone is in a band like Suck It Easy because everyone is in Suck It Easy. And that's what I'm going to say. Great response. Well, I don't even have anything more to add, <laughs> Benjamin. I hope that answers your letter. <laughs> 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 well there you go <laughs> benjamin why must you waste our time with with questions and letters that you already know the answer to right i mean mm -hmm. we already knew the answer to that but it's it's great to hear easy blues yeah. talk about that and um so there you have it <laughs> very nicely done well <clears throat> that's good from our listener mailbag for this time around mm -hmm. i want to thank everybody for writing in Anytime you have questions or comments or anything you'd like to add, you can write into our show here by writing to sunnycalzone at gmail.com. That's S-O-N-N-Y-C-A-L-Z-O-N-E at gmail.com. Who is Sonny Calzone? Well, he's our program director. And if you'll go ahead and uh, send in your emails to us with the subject line on the bunny bus, and then inside your email itself, just go ahead and Tell us your name and where you're from, city and state. And if you're from outside of the U.S., just uh, let us know where you are from, from outside of the U.S. And so we always like to let our listeners and viewers know where the folks are who are sending in their wonderful, wonderful letters to us via email. And um, <clears throat> so, great. Once again, you can send us your stuff to sunnycalzone at gmail.com. Now that takes care of listener mail for today. We're going to roll right on into our next segment because that's that's just how we roll here at On the Bunny Bus. And this next segment is called Tales from Munchaba. Now if I had oh. a sort of cool reverb or echo effect on my voice, it would sound a lot cooler. So I'm just doing that in the hopes that it actually does something. Yeah, anything. yeah. Know let, let, let me let me Tales from Munchaba. Now, that's pretty good. Now, that's what Thank we're you. going for. Thank you. So, Tales from Munchaba. Um, <clears throat> what is Munchaba? Well, what is Munchaba is a question posed in the present tense as opposed to the past tense. Now, <clears throat> a proper way to ask that question might be, what was Munchaba? But but the fact is that uh, Munchaba is still... still worthy of being mentioned in terms of the present tense because of the impact that mm -hmm. it had not just on the lives of easy blues and myself who who took a lot of good away from those experiences and um but it also touched the lives of so many not just performers but also just members of the public who wanted to come mm -hmm. down and witness cool performances um all sorts of different styles, different genres, appealing to different age groups. It just was great. Um, and it really, it really was the heartbeat of central Long Island in terms of uh, Eastern Nassau County anyway, which is really in the heart of the island. And so <clears throat> in certain respects, it was the heartbeat of the island. And it was where <clears throat> where the Suck It Easy Band first appeared on stage as the Suck It Easy Band. Mm -hmm. uh, this goes back to 2002. So 21 years ago, our band first made its appearance on stage at this place, and we went on to have countless memories. I still have so many memories from that place, even though I'm well aware that I've already forgotten more than I remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I do remember from it is uh, certainly worth hanging on to. A lot of great times, some good times, some not so good times, but even the not so good times were were lessons, life lessons for me. And um, they they all taught me something. Even the folks that I was 
only in contact with for a short time at Munchava. Um, even just uh, having been around them for a short time taught me something. Everything is a teacher if you know how to listen. And it's mm. not even so much if you know how to learn, but just really if you know how to listen. And of course, if you know how to look, um, you know, see what your peers are doing up on stage, see what their strengths are, see what maybe some of their weaknesses are and what they might need to work on a little bit if they choose to do so. Otherwise, if not, then they they just have full freedom of expression, just like everyone else does. And everybody has their own opportunities to explore their own limits mm. and discover what their own personal boundaries are as performers. And uh, whether you're a singer or a drummer or a keyboard player or a horn player or anything, of course, there are always going to be boundaries in terms of uh, where you should stay within <clears throat> because of your talent level not everyone has the same because of your personality um not everyone has such a polished one um some folks really struggle with shyness or anxiety and um, maybe performing on stage is, is a means to an end for them in, in the sense that they can use it as a way to open up and come out of their shell a little bit and become more of a, a fully formed, mature individual. Um, some use it for soul searching. You can use it for all sorts of reasons. Um, of course, you know, you can also abuse it. Mm -hmm. and now, <clears throat> we never want to see anybody do that. But of course, uh, at the end of the day, even an abuse of, of one's talents can be a road or a pathway towards wisdom wisdom mm -hmm. which um, said person might not otherwise have the opportunity to obtain mm -hmm. and so at the end of the day you know it's all good whatever gets you through the night it's all right thank you john and now as far as us uh, you know being here with tales from machaba there is um there's one tale that um that i would love to to tell and it involves the basement beneath machaba mm -hmm. where a lot of a lot of hanging out went on and a lot of cool stuff went down um, upstairs, of course, was where all the main action was, but upstairs wasn't telling you the whole story. Mm. Um, at any rate, uh, Easy Blues, why don't we begin uh, this segment today with a with a tale from Manchava of your own, one of your own tales, please, if you would, good sir. <laughs> well, honestly, uh, there's so many incredible uh, memories that you can go through, but really, for me, always the, the most amazing experience was... I think it was some sort of party. It might have been a, a birthday party of yours. Um, and I believe we, like, Suck It Easy kind of played. And I remember Jeff was actually kind of running um, Munchaba there for, for a hot minute. Um, and all of a sudden, John Johnny Beehive jumped up and he did an acoustic set. And then Jeff Regan jumped up and he did an acoustic set. And then they hand me the guitar. And they're like, oh, go do an acoustic set. And I was not ready for any of that. And and also I performer-wise, I love I love to perform and different things like that. But I still have some insecurities when it comes to like playing the stringed instrument and, and doing those kind of things. And I I always looked at both um Johnny and and Jeff on that extra level. Like that was what I was trying to practice to be, you know, um, to to help to level up and to share that stage with them. And then not only that, but for both of them to like rush up and like, and then I think actually a couple of um, Tank's uh, biker friends like came up to me afterwards, like that was amazing. Like, thank you so much. And I was like, really? <laughs> um, it was it was just incredible to have that type of experience. And especially with Suck It Easy, this is what would happen all the time. And, you know, where you could be performing and and not realize that you're playing with like one of the the top bass players that has been, you know, playing for 30 plus years and, you know, showed up to do this one gig because, you know, it sounded like fun. And now you're sticking your hand into a bucket and pulling out a song and hoping the rest of the band knows how to play it because the suck it bucket was just such an incredible invention. Um, but yeah, it was those moments to me that are always going to be the best. And, and for that one, definitely playing acoustically uh, at, having to play after Johnny Beehive and, and Jeff Regan and feel like I actually held my own. 
uh, was was an accomplishment. And like I put a feather in my cap that day. It was great. Yeah, that was that was a very cool little milestone and a stepping stone yeah. towards towards becoming the, the fine performer that you have become. And um, I think that um, I would certainly trust I would trust anyone on a stage with Johnny Beehive and mm -hmm. and Jeff Regan. Those guys were warm and welcoming and just a great support system for for anybody to have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do remember the suck it bucket. Um, I see reminders of it all the time. <laughs> all the time <laughs> i saw one just yesterday in fact and even though it's been it's been eons now mm. since since the suck it bucket was was on a stage i can look over my right shoulder right now you'll see me looking over my right shoulder and i'm looking right at the bucket oh, it's on top yes. of my, it's on top of my fridge I keep it there so I can always look at it and it'll, it'll remind me that I am mortal. Yes. <laughs> it'll remind me of, of those uh, those interesting ways that that not just I, but you and mm -hmm. all of us who were on stage when we were doing things with that bucket, we were we were challenging ourselves as entertainers in in uh, in ways that that you'll never, and I mean never see other bands do and i think there's a good reason why you don't see bands do this and having been on the inside looking out just like easy blues was we have a unique perspective we have also been on the outside looking in where we performed on stage numerous times without the bucket so we know what it, we know what life is like after the bucket our lives have been forever changed, though, because we incorporated that bucket into our shows. And it not just changed the, the flow of the performance itself as a whole, but it also changed the performers in ways mm -hmm. that it, it, it gave us, it gave us, I, I want to say the word self-confidence, but, and I know it, it gets thrown around so much that's like a bud word, a buzzword rather. I don't even care much for the term self-confidence, but I will say that it made me feel like I achieved something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead of um instead of just okay, I, I practiced for my show, I practiced all my songs, I practiced them to death. I can play them in my sleep. I can play them blindfolded. I can sing them without looking at printed out lyric sheets okay, I'm ready to go and do my show that I've rehearsed so well for. Okay, that's great. That's a standard way of approaching musicianship and being an entertainer, and I get it. Um, <clears throat> and it's how you it's how you get to Carnegie Hall one day. You know, practice, practice, practice. Nobody gets to perform at Carnegie Hall if you're going to be doing live performances like the Suck It Easy Band did. Uh-uh. Not us, and there are reasons why bands don't use the suck it bucket. Um, probably they don't use it, first of all, because they saw us use it. So why would they want to copy us, right? Everybody wants to try to be a little bit different, I think, mm -hmm. than everyone else. I guess, unless you're all wrapped up in tribute band hell, but don't get me started with that. Um, now, as far as... Um, the socket bucket is concerned. Yes, I see reminders of it on a daily basis. And sometimes I'll even see uh, little pieces of paper that once were in the bucket, but now are just randomly on the floor of the inside of my car. And okay. they've been there since I left New York and I'm never taking them out of my car. These, these weird little strips of paper that you'll sometimes see on the floor of my car if you're ever riding in the back seat with me. Mm -hmm. uh, don't give it too much thought. Just know that once upon a time, those little pieces of paper were part of my band and yeah. uh, with me. So it's strange to think of little pieces of paper as being in a band with me, but that's how I look at it. And that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. All right. That was a cool tale from Munchaba that you had there. Thank now, you. I have got a tale for 
you and not just for you, but also for everyone out there in YouTube land enjoying the show. Munchaba was a nightclub. It was often referred to also as a lounge. You can call mm -hmm. it a nightclub or a lounge, whatever you want. Um, they had a nice, um, they had a cabaret license. So they were able to have the elevated stage area, which was very nice, and a little drum riser area for when people wanted to set up some drums. It wasn't the biggest stage in the world, but it didn't need to be um, because the, the performers who uh, were blessed enough to grace that stage had uh, had hearts that were bigger even than the stage itself. And even though the heart of Manchaba was upstairs uh, where the live performances were and where the drinks were served and where the little different color-coded seating areas were arranged. Mm -hmm. there, was like, there was a blue room, there was a yellow room, there was, um, I think it was a red room. If I'm not mistaken, they went with the, the primary colors of blue, mm -hmm. yellow, and red. Um, not unlike the Starship Enterprise, random segue, Earlier today, I was listening to Easy Town Radio, and it was the William Shatner episode. Um, now, <clears throat> prior to the taping of this episode here of On the Bunny Bus today, Easy Blues was made aware that I was uh, listening to that uh, mm -hmm. William Shatner episode of Easy Town Radio earlier today. And um, <laughs> I think he enjoyed knowing that I was giving it a listen. Yes. Um, I was listening to it off of my hard drive. So in case any of you are out there in YouTube land, if you're wondering where you can find the William Shatner episode of Easy Town Radio on YouTube, the short answer is you won't. Um, but the um, the longer answer is uh, that you, you can find it if you search. So wink, wink, smile, seek and ye shall find. And back to the story. Okay, so the heartbeat for the Manchaba nightclub was upstairs where the stage was and the bar was and all of that other stuff. Downstairs was what I often thought of as the second heartbeat of the club. <clears throat> Just like a cow has more than one heart, Manchaba had more than one heart of its own. Downstairs, it had a, a bit of a different heartbeat. And um, not everyone was uh, allowed to go and experience what it was like downstairs. Downstairs was sort of a sort of a VIP hangout section where there would sometimes be card games going on, and sometimes there would just be some folks who be who might be warming up for their show that they're going to play upstairs, just practicing acoustically before they go upstairs to perform electrically or whatever the case might be. It was a great hangout spot. I can still see it so clearly in my mind, even though I haven't been to Manchaba in many years, and no one has, quite frankly, because um, it became, it ended up becoming like a jazzercise fitness studio or something. Um, but um, anyway, the, uh, the downstairs heartbeat of Manchaba was great, and it allowed me to have the opportunity to enjoy, um, to enjoy Manchaba, but on a mellower scale with uh, just only a small handful of us who might be down there at the, at any one given time, whether it was two of us or three of us or four of us. Um, I have really cool memories of of just hanging out down there with uh, even just with John Coleman, formerly of Mama Cat, and myself. Uh, John, rest in peace. I remember when uh, Machaba was uh, in the hands of uh, of John for a time. And um, this was uh, a cool friendship. He and I shared some really cool music bonds that were deeply rooted in classic rock. So sometimes John and I would be downstairs and we would just randomly be singing Creedence Clearwater revival songs or singing songs by the doors or, you know, any of that other really cool classic California rock that we liked. Why John and I like California rock so much, I don't know. Um, I'm not even from California, but um, all my life, I think, growing up, I've always been exposed to um, rock music from the bands that have come out of California. And um, anytime I ever had a chance to form a cool bond with a fellow entertainer or a good friend who I met out on the scene, if it was a friendship that was even partially forged in the fires of the music of The Doors or the music of Creedence Clearwater Revival, that was something pretty special and unique. I can't 
really not say that about very many folks at all right. in my life. Um, <clears throat> something similar I can say about Easy Blues is uh, Easy Blues and myself both happen to share an affinity for the music of the Blues Brothers and a lot of the music that they help keep alive. Even the, mm. the, Blues, the Blues Brothers didn't perform any original music, but they didn't have to perform original music. They had their own music to share that had already come before them, and they were just helping to continue to light the way and be a lighthouse to help uh, other folks know that you can have safe harbor here with this old music, and you don't need to get so frustrated and lost with today's music and get all wrapped up and wondering who to follow or what should I listen to next. But all you have to do is just look back into the past for a lot of your great answers. So much great music came from the 50s and the 60s. And then along came the Blues Brothers in the 70s to make sure mm -hmm. that the 50s and the 60s music was still going to be alive. And uh, in a way, helping to also keep the 50s and 60s alive. And um, so anytime you folks out there in YouTube land ever have a chance to forge a friendship or some kind of a bond with somebody that that involves a, a certain band, a certain music, a certain genre, a certain time period, whatever it might be. Just uh, don't take that for granted because it, it really is something special. And it's been said that studies have shown that only one in approximately 80 other people are even remotely similar. Mm. And um, <clears throat> the more folks you meet in life, more people you have the opportunity to make friendships with, the more opportunities you'll have to meet that one in 80 people who are out there that you can <clears throat> have a real chance to, to make a, a cool connection with. And so so don't don't underestimate the, the value of uh, keeping great old music alive. Mm -hmm. The Blues Brothers did it, lots of other bands do it, um, but of course, uh, the Suck It Easy band is no exception. We became well known as a cover band, and a cover band we were, and cover bands don't really do original material, And um, <clears throat> but, uh, but that's fine. You know, there's all sorts of ways to approach being in a band, and there are all sorts of cover bands, and I like to think that Cover bands each try to do something a little bit different from other cover bands, even if they're not trying to go for the full shedding of the skin and the full reinventing of the wheel. Nobody has to reinvent the wheel. It's not necessary. Just be yourself. Be your most authentic self and don't be afraid to, of course, challenge yourself. <clears throat> Inspire others. and um, But at the same time, be inspired yourself and when you start to lose inspiration, you can always find it again very easily just by looking back through the old record collection. I know mm -hmm. that that's a turn of phrase that doesn't apply to so many people these days because everything's digital. But once upon a time, there were such things as record collections. And, there uh, still are, actually. They're, they are making a very big uh, comeback come I know. right now. I know. And, uh, it's very yeah. true. A, yeah, good, and, a, a good buddy, a former bandmate, Paul Wenzel, who lives in Pennsylvania okay. these days. Paul has a new band uh, called Wirehound, and they're releasing their new album only on vinyl. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it is awesome. It's a it's a great move. And there there is this rising resurgence of DJs, and DJs need vinyl, and mm -hmm. DJs want to have access to vinyl, and they want to go to these... DJ vinyl conventions and they want to go mm -hmm. to record conventions and and you can still you can still find vinyl at all sorts of shops you don't just have to go to music stores you can go to thrift shops you mm -hmm. can go to goodwill locations and you can of course of course everybody's favorite the aftermarket eBay mm. and uh, you can find just about anything you want anywhere anytime all you need is access to the internet really um, but uh, but yeah, vinyl is making a comeback. And um, but just to circle back around to to the original point, um, yes, you'll never run out of inspiration because mm -hmm. there will never be there will never be a finite supply of music for you to go back and explore again 
or mm -hmm. rediscover maybe for your first time in a while or discover for your first time ever. In fact, Easy Blues is a great dude to ask for music suggestions. And uh, so if you're ever wondering what you might want to listen to next, that's the dude right there. And um, so how to reach Easy Blues for suggestions on music? That's easy. Just uh, send an email into our program director, Sonny Calzone. And uh, just, of course, you know, right on the bunny bus as the subject line for the email. And then, of course, in your email, you can just write, hey, Easy Blues, I need a suggestion for, for this or that or, you know, whatever. Listen, Easy Blues is here to give you all the suggestions you need. And, um, and so am I and so are we. Um, but, exactly. um, so anyway, that was cool. It's always fun to talk about Machaba. And mm -hmm. there are so many more stories uh, that we can share about that place. I mean, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but let's say that's uh, that's enough for now. And we'll we'll turn the page on Manchaba for this episode. Sounds like a plan. And, um, <clears throat> let's slide right on in to interrogation. This is another dun, dun, dun. Of those moments where I wish I had a dun dun dun. Interrogation. Dun dun dun. That's right. Interrogation. What happens during interrogation? Well, Easy Blues and myself, we interrogate one another. Big surprise, right? I know. Okay, so um, I have three very carefully crafted inquiries for my mm. brother Easy Blues today. And, um, but um, rather than shoot Easy Blues with all three of these questions at once, machine gun style, um, I'm sure Easy Blues has questions for me, so let's alternate. Uh, and why don't we start with Easy Blues um, firing a question at me, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, this 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 is one that I have thought very long and hard for, and uh, I think this is an incredible uh, question. I will say I'm going to give myself a pat on the shoulder, not in the back, just on the shoulder, because I love this question. Okay, so when your D&D &D campaign gets trapped in an orc sub-dungeon, do you cast fireball or do you depend on your bard's charisma roll? Oh. Mm. How's my supply of material spell components looking right now? You're you're looking you're looking good. You also have just been through a big battle prior. So you were actually running to escape. So you are you are a little shot. Like you you know your 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 fight your fighter and your paladin both took some damage. You're trying trying to get into that sub dungeon to really heal to go and then take on the world, and now you're trapped. Well, out comes the bard charisma roll. There you go. There you go. Appreciate that. I have to go in that direction. I'm. I mean, after all, I am a bard. Um, now I get it. Uh, the whole purpose of of D and D is 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 escapism and and uh, you know the enjoyment of of being someplace else and being someone else. Um, and uh, so maybe I went for the low hanging fruit there by saying bard, but that's okay. It's all right. One of my um, old bandmates, Jay Coglin, <clears throat> who was affectionately known as Jay Boner during his time with the band, now lives in Hawaii, and um, Jay. Um, Oh, no, it wasn't Jay. But hi, Jay, if you're listening out there. It was, uh, it was my buddy, uh, John Enfield, who lives here in Las Vegas. And John was kind enough to make a comment on uh, one of my social media postings from uh, yesterday when I was playing music for the lifeguards over at the Green Valley Ranch Pool. <clears throat> His comment was, oh, a real life bard or something like that, something mm -hmm. to that effect. And it just reminded me that uh, yes, a real life bard. We we do exist. There there are those of us out there in the wild. Um, and if you look hard enough, and if you look for a long enough period of time, you will find us. So, and uh, we are generally good folks to meet. But so yes, I'm going for the bard charisma role on that. And I hope I answered your question, my brother. That was that was amazing. And to talk about the bard aspect, I don't know if you've seen this. I actually have troubadour tattooed on my collarbone very nice tat yeah thank you thank you so yeah i i too live the bard life it's a yes, bard knock yeah. life for you, us you you continue to live the bard life it's a it's a bard knock life for us <laughs> it's a bard knock life <laughs> for us <laughs> okay 
<laughs> hey, you even got me singing out of that question you asked me. Son of a gun. Nobody gets me to sing anymore. How about that? Ah, there we go. You, you sing in the opening. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was, <laughs> well, but, right, but again, that's just yeah. another example of, of you getting me to sing. I mean, uh, it's, it's rare that anyone gets me to sing. There you go. Anyway. Well, awesome. <laughs> Anyhow. Anyhow. I have a question for you. That's good. And the question refers to the Blues Brothers. Now, <clears throat> my question is, which of the many Blues Brothers songs surprised you the most? Mm. Uh. I knew it. I knew this wasn't one you were going to be able to answer in like five seconds. No, I, I it, it's it. not because because uh, it it also depends on the day or the mood, you know. Because and and also thinking about the different iterations of of the Blues Brothers, because this is also an entity that is still going on to this very day, to the point where they you know literally have their own brand of marijuana. Um, yes, and thanks, I, Jim. I've been, Yes, I've been watching Growing Belushi. I suggest everyone do it. Um, I, I love it. He's 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 just becoming cooler and cooler to me on an everyday basis. Um, and I just, yeah, absolutely amazing. But, you know, I think, honestly, mm, oof. I think the one that always catches me off guard and as per, like, no matter the mood that I'm in will always put a smile on my face is Rubber Biscuit. Yeah, just you know choice. yeah i you think know, that, that song i think that that surprised me too because of dan Aykroyd's ability to to sing in that way mm -hmm. not everybody can pull that off and and i can't i certainly can't and i i've tried but and with enough practice i probably could could give you a a, a passable version of that but that's a great answer right there why don't you, you tell our tell our listeners about the rubber biscuit song that they might not be familiar with it. it 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 is an older song much older yeah. well what's what's incredible about the the rubber biscuit song in particular is it really does highlight um the voice and also vo uh, vocal pronunciation where you're dealing kind of with that scat feel to it um but you're also making sure that the, the, your p's are super pronounced you know um your b's your and you have to have that 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 r roll like down down to a science and then you also have to remember he dan Aykroyd was not the front person you know he he was the side guy he was the harp guy sang the majority of the harmonies so when he was able to take that step out and deliver so incredibly well and and really it's just talking about the struggle um you know and the struggle obviously struggle of being a musician struggling of being a blues musician where some days or even like in sales or in life in particular some days you 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 have a sirloin steak for dinner, and some days you have tuna fish, and some days you have a wish sandwich, um, and that's where you have two pieces of bread, and you wish you had something to put in the middle of it. Um, that whole story is just, it's so incredibly done well, and you you see a lot of other stuff come from there. Like I actually look at, you know, I think a lot of hip hop has very similar delivery when they're having the over pronunciation and making sure that things are falling into that rhythmic meter. Um, I'm not saying it's the first hip hop song of all time. I'm just saying I can see where some hip hop artists like MF Doom or like my, my good friend Chesky, you know, have their type of delivery. It is rooted in the blues, which I think is beautiful. Yeah, no, you're right. A lot of what folks consider urban music or rap music and hip hop goes all the way back to the early days of, of the blues masters and the jazz masters and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, great choice, man. I think Rubber Biscuit is a very surprising song in general, specifically the Blues Brothers version of mm -hmm. it. Yeah, And um, I would strongly recommend all of our listeners and viewers to get out there and enjoy a listen of the rubber biscuit song by the blues brothers um you might even well, I got there might even be a live concert footage version of it on youtube somewhere it, there might be and i will i will also say that i believe the recording aspect is is a live performance as well so he was able to do those very particular 
you know, vocal riffs live. Yeah. You know, know. and that's without a net. It's impressive. Yeah. You can only imagine how many hours Danny was was rehearsing for for that, just going over that stuff, just to get the hang the hang of it. Although he may have just been such a natural, where where for him, one or two quick rehearsals of it, and then and then he'll just say to himself, "Okay, I'm good. Let's go." And I, before we before we jump off the Blues Brothers thing, I have to. I don't know if I've told you this or not, but um, the producer that I, I work with out here, Vic Steffens, um, actually uh works worked with matt guitar murphy rest in peace um and, and yes. uh he recorded a couple records in the studio that, that i'm recording in um and it's it's been just an incredible experience to, to be in that room and have that energy and to know that this is where incredible things have happened so yeah that, that is cool and i do remember that you were telling me that story and i, I remember that it reminded me of uh, of how cool of a player matt murphy was and that he got to be in a band with Steve Cropper, also on guitar. Just just an amazing one-two punch mm-hmm. for guitar players. And um, I would love to have had the opportunity to see them perform live um, during their heyday. Mm-hmm. But um, thankfully, there's enough video concert footage that's been that's been put to film over the years and it's, mm-hmm. up, it's up on YouTube now. If you want to look around, you'll find it. I'm, I'm so glad that it was taped because you know, mm. we, can all, we can enjoy it always forever. Even if, you know, from a distance, it's a bit of a colder way to enjoy it, I suppose. But, um, but it's better than not having any way to enjoy it. Believe you me. Very true. Very true. Mm-hmm. All right. I believe I have a question for you. Okay. Well, next question. All right. Now, Kind of in that same type of vein, but only slightly to the left. What is your favorite Hall and Oates song to perform, and why? My favorite Hall and Oates song to perform. It's probably going to scare you how how prepared I am to answer this question. The answer is one on one mm. from nineteen eighty three. Why do I love to perform it? I think that's because of how adventurous the bridge of the song is. A lot of times when I'm performing music live, I find myself enjoying a song more when it has an when it has a, a bridge that is interesting or or a solo section that is particularly interesting. And you can find a lot of that in some of the in some of the Hall and Oates music from right around that time period, mm-hmm. the early 1980s. <clears throat> they were one of the early MTV music video darlings, and it was it became impossible to escape Hall and Oates after a while if you were watching MTV in 1980, uh, 1983. Um, but uh, then again, I also think that um, one of my favorite reasons to perform the one-on-one song live is the way the end of the song challenges me as a player. Mm. Um, When I play, when I perform, I perform instrumental music using ukuleles. I don't, I don't sing, but when I perform using a ukulele and I arrive at a section towards the end of a song, an outro that is particularly challenging to play, that's when I find myself enjoying the experience of of performing music a bit more because I'm Mm. challenging myself a bit more. And One on One is a a challenging song to, to play, even though it follows the standard intro verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, bridge, outro, um, formula. Mm-hmm. And now you can sit here until you're blue in the face and tell me, oh, that formula is tired. And I will look you right back in the eyes and I will say, oh, yeah, it sure as hell is. <laughs> Somebody had better take that formula and put it out and back to the barn. And... Um, you know, do a little something with it there. But I think that when you 
are presented with music that still is in that old formula, and you know you have to perform it live, and if you've already done it a bunch of times, or if you're like me, maybe you've done certain songs thousands of times, you have to find ways to keep it interesting for yourself. And so the end of the song One on One by Hall and Oates, it gives you some very adventurous directions to follow. Mm. If you're going to play the instrument like I do, which is melodically instead of rhythmically, mm -hmm. I, I will not play rhythmically and I will not use a pick when I play. It's all fingers, all finger work and all finger picking and it's all melodic. I'll play mm -hmm. melody lines and I'll play solos, but I won't really play rhythms. So this means when I arrive at the end of the song that's that has a complex arrangement towards the end, like one on one does, where Daryl Hall is just going in all sorts of directions with his voice. Mm -hmm. He's taking the melody in different directions while the rhythm stays what the rhythm is. And there is, of course, the refrain, the the outro refrain of the chorus, which sort of goes one on one. I wanna play that game tonight, and it sort of does that again and again, over and over, on on a loop. It's not really on a loop, but it's just mm -hmm. a band, band doing that outro again. It's almost like a coda, so it becomes mm -hmm. a refrain. But while the band does that, Daryl Hall does something else with his voice. And as a musician, I tend to follow where the voice goes. My background is voice. Mm -hmm. it's always going to be me, and it's always going to be what I was and what I am. But when it comes to playing music melodically on string instruments that's what happens and there's your answer one-on-one -on -one by hall and Oates. that is a beautiful answer thank you so much that was i like that journey we went on a wonderful journey there yes cool it's yeah. a cool journey i recommend everybody take that journey at least once or sixty-five thousand times yes it's true definitely well speaking of journeys it's time now for question number two two what was Wheel of Easy? <laughs> and who better to uh, answer this than you? Wheel of Easy, first of all, is this incredible literal wheel. It is a giant wheel that you would spin and it right. would land on a style of music. But what, what's the most incredible aspect of it was there was this game that you, had, you guys had all put together where you show up for like a suck it easy performance right. and you're just paired in with different musicians and you have to spin the wheel of easy and whatever style of music it lands on you have to perform that style of music and as per the audience reaction you can get the points that you know were qualified for that aspect or you couldn't if you if and you know sometimes some people can pull everything off some people can't you know and and there were just those different aspects, but it was also what was incredible about it. And it's something that I really, one of the things I, I was talking with you um, off air about is, is I definitely want to, uh, to get into the venue aspect of it. Um, and I kind of want to do almost like a, uh, you know, uh, for an open mic, just have the, have the wheel of easy up there. And if the band has the courage to spin the wheel and they land on it, then I'll give them a headlining show. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's how you get, mean. yeah, that's how you get from the open mic to, to, a, to headlining a Thursday night. Cool idea. Yeah. It also gives them a little, a little bit of a fun way to challenge themselves too. Exactly. Exactly. And, and no matter what, in all forms of art, it's supposed to be scary. There's, there's, it's, a, there's supposed to evoke an emotion from you. There's supposed to, you know, your stomach is supposed to turn a little bit. You're, it, it should make people somewhat feel uncomfortable. Uh, you know, and, and I love also how you stated, you know, you have to live your authentic self even when role playing, because as Camus says, you know, the goal in life is to live so authentically as yourself that your mere existence makes other people uncomfortable. That is really quite a quote. And I have heard that quote over the years. That's a cool one. <laughs> it's one of, one of my favorites. So yes, that, that is definitely my, my answer there. And I think, are you ready? Yeah. 
All right. So this is your final question. It's the I'm final ready. question. All right. Here we go. Now, I'm going to dig deep a little bit. Throughout your entire career with Suck It Easy, and even in what you're, what you're doing now, which, again, I still feel is Suck It Easy. It's just the newest invention of it. What is and or was the one song you really wish you could have played? The one song I wish that I could have played when I still had the chance back in New York? Yes. As a singer? Yes. As a singer. As a singer. Love on the Rocks by Neil Diamond from The Jazz Singer. That's amazing. <laughs> I was not expecting that at all. And that is, that is, oh, all right. Ah, it makes and I complete would, sense. I, I was going to say, I, I, I would say, oh, you knew I was going to say that. But the truth is, I don't think you knew that I would say I had that. no idea. I had no idea. But now that I hear it, it makes complete and total sense. It's, it? it's it's yeah it's like it's one of those aha moments like i like i think the only other one would probably and i'm sure you've done it would i, I would have maybe expected like i don't know uh, a gloria gainer song or something you know just something just a little bit outside of that left field wow well it, it was it, it let's let's just say that that that's not really a question that i get asked every day um mm -hmm. but um <clears throat> that is the way that I will answer it today. Now, tomorrow I may right. answer that question in an entirely different way, but um, yeah, that's going to mm -hmm. be my answer for you today on that one. Okay. All yeah. right. I remember being a young kid when that movie first came out. It was a movie and it was a soundtrack and there was a single and it was, um, I don't think it was nominated for any Golden Globes or academy awards but um but the uh, the movie was uh, one of those films that became aired on hbo um constantly in hbo's early days when they were well known for showing the same movie again and again and, and again. again so if you don't catch it you know in the morning you can have another chance the next day or maybe that same day um but yeah the jazz singer was on a lot and i got a chance to see that movie a few times over the years and it left an impression on me great song though um love on the rocks uh has a is a cool arrangement um lyrically uh in terms of the the words it's not a particularly happy song but that's okay mm -hmm. i mean um, i really just like that song more for its melody and uh, for its musical arrangement. Um, I do sometimes perform it on ukulele, um, mm. although I totally missed my chance to perform it in New York with the band. Mm. So there's my answer to you. And um, so now we have arrived at my final question for you for this episode number two of On the Bunny Bus. And this question is, what was Easy Town Radio? I love these easy questions. <laughs> I do, I do. I love these easy questions, but it, it, it's it's so. <laughs> it really is an easy question. Um, easy Town Radio was podcasting before podcasting was really a thing. Um, it, it again, as as we say about um, Suck It Easy, it wasn't ahead of its time as much as it was a example of of its time, um, and. It was a spot where we could take for a radio show because there was no visual for it. Um, we, we, we treat it as the old school like radio format um, as for like when you would listen to like Superman or, you know, back in the day when you had to get uh, um, your, your oval team, you know, and you have to get your, your, your decoder ring. Um, so we oh, took kids the, today that, won't know anything about that stuff, but you're right. Uh, you know, it's fine. They, I'm sure they at least watch the newest Christmas story if they have not watched the older one. Um, There's a new know. one. 
Yeah, yeah, there's a new one. Yeah, it's actually really good. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it was heartwarming and then kind of weird. Um, but it's okay. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it's so we, we, you have this opportunity to be amongst creatives. Um, and these are people that initially, when, when I met, um, were all creative in the music aspect of it and and i did not realize everyone could stretch their their comedy gene um and writing comedy and and performing comedy is one of the hardest things in the world to do um you know at any point in time it's it's actually rather easy to make someone feel sad or to make someone cry but to make someone laugh um it it shows a real um uh, it shows a real mental stretch and you know it was it was an incredible situation to to be sitting around with creatives that were willing to take that risk and 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 to you know almost paying tribute to the theater of the of the ridiculous back in the the, the 50s 60s um and 70s that, that uh that later warhol came out of where there was no real limit no real um wall that we had that we wouldn't push back against or wouldn't push on um, and we were able to, you know, cover interesting topics and we got to do it from a zany point of view. Um, fans of like Benny Hill or fans of, of like Monty Python, um, we were all, and, uh, we, we were able to, to really hit on that moment. And I started to see a lot more, um, <laughs> When you are the weird kid and sitting in the back of class and these, these, these ideas run through your head um, and you, you do it solitarily, um, you, you can get a complex. But when you're able to stretch these muscles with other like-minded um, art-driven individuals, um, you actually can see that that's who you're supposed to be. You know, and, and, and from the first day sitting down to do an Easy Town uh, radio episode to today, I understand that you have to get weird. It's important. Um, you need it. And the weirder you can get, uh, um, the, the happier you will be. Um, you know, a lot of these norms and, and rules and regulations that uh, society has placed upon all of us, uh, eh, meh, meh, you know, um, you know, you've got, you've got to push back a little bit. You've got to, You've got to be that punk rocker just a little bit. And, and whether that be when you're in the military, you buy Converse. Uh, and every, everyone that's listening to this, this show, watching us right now, if you're in the military, I want you to go to the, to the PX and I want you to buy yourself Converse um, combat boots. Converse combat boots. Because that should be the punk rock soldier. And all of you should be out there why, why rocking Air Force uh, Chuck Taylor's but in, in combat boot form, because it's necessary, you know, be weird, be strange, be authentic, and you'll be happy. Oh, yeah. The Easy Town Radio show sure was weird. <laughs> yes, it was. But also, I mean, you have the ability to do all of these interesting characters. And, and when you are playing a character, you can say things you wouldn't genuinely say um, in your real life. Uh, and, and you have, it's, it's just, it's so free, um, you know, and, and characters that to this day I carry through, you know, I'll, I'll be in a situation and I'd be like, Hmm, I want, you know, I'll see someone that looks a certain type of way. I was like, that dude reminds me of Donuts, you know, a completely made up character, but I can wow. see that person on the streets, you know, it, it's pretty dope. That is cool. That is cool. And perhaps even once in a while, from time to time, you might find yourself in a certain life situation where you think to yourself, hmm, what would Donuts do? <laughs> right? Am I right? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. And then sometimes... And, and I, if you I, are I hate to keep going back to Donuts because we <laughs> right. can also, we can easily go to Rocco Rollerbone and we can easily mm -hmm. go to uh, all of the other characters that there were. I mean, right. my God, there were so many. <laughs> but thank you for I, answering that. Oh, of course. I also love the fact that you were listening to the Shatner episode, which is the episode kind of that is like this show, because we lost like all the recorded footage of everybody else. And you and I had to do the entire episode over again. <laughs> yeah. And now here we are, you and I, we've lost yes. everyone else in the band. And we're the only ones left right here on this podcast doing this yes. on the Bunny Bus show. It's almost like we have the whole bus to ourselves. We do. We have the whole bus to ourselves, and and this will forever be our Shatner episode. It's amazing. 
<laughs> it is amazing. And, and speaking of the bunny bus, I know I can still remember in my mind's eye walking into the bus and then making a left and then walking uh, straight towards the back. I can still see it all so so clearly and vividly in my mind's eye. It'll probably never disappear. And um, and I'm glad that we have the uh, the opportunity to do these podcast episodes yes. for those folks out there in YouTube land who might be wondering, hey, whatever happened to that bus? Uh, hey, whatever happened to that band? You know, I mean, and uh, <clears throat> the truth is, we're uh, we're still right here, and and uh, the bus is still right here too. It just lives in our hearts and lives and lives on in the hearts and minds and the spirits of us all. And um, but um, <clears throat> on behalf of Easy Blues and myself, we would like to wish you a happy Memorial Day, and uh, thank you very much for joining us here on on the Bunny Bus. This is our second episode. And we'll be back again with episode number three before long. And uh, but of course, uh, before we sign off, Easy Blues, have you any parting words of wisdom or little nuggets to share with the folks out there in YouTube land? Make sure you embrace every moment, whether it be good, whether it be bad, whether it be indifferent, embrace it, because that is what is really happening right now. There's so many things that you can jump away from reality for. But it's hollow. Um, you know, I've, I've been able to, to have such an incredible experience because I'm not afraid to take that step and to take that uh, plunge, whether it be the deep sea uh, diving that, that I might do one day or it just be getting out and having a this week, I challenge everyone to break into one, at least one moment of just random dancing. Just randomly dance one time this week and see if your day gets better. Yeah, just turn into like a one person flash mob and do your yep. thing. Exactly. Let the freak fly, fly. Yes. Let the freak flag fly. And Let also, if you want to do that and your friend is with you, record it and email it to sunnycalzone at gmail.com and we'll talk about it, you know, during, during listener mail. Now that would be something. And we will be on the lookout for that. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. Thank you to all who served. Easy Blues, thank you for having served. And today is the day we give thanks to all who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the defense of the freedom that many of us take for granted sometimes. But we always remember on Memorial Day to give thanks for those who laid down their lives in the defense of this great nation. For all of you out there in YouTube land, we thank you very much for being here with us on this journey and allowing both Easy Blues and myself the opportunity to go back on the bunny bus. And we will be back on the bunny bus again when we do episode three. That should be happening sometime soonish. So stay tuned. In the, in the meantime, if you're enjoying this on YouTube, please uh, click on like, Click on subscribe and remember to click the notification bell so you'll always find out when the new episodes pop up at our YouTube channel, which is the Roundhouse Network. All right, Easy Blues, you enjoy yourself a great rest of the day there. I'll see you soon. Definitely. Out there in YouTube land, we'll see you real soon. Real soon.